The cheery chirp of my wife's phone rings through my tired ears. I force my eyes open to a squint, searching for red numbers of my digital clock. 3.43. It's the call. My wife shifts in bed, as she always does, and grabs her phone. 911, what's your emergency? She always answers like that. My wife used to be a police dispatcher, which left her with a lot of stories. Some funny, some tragic. She's been retired for six years, but every night at 3.43 a.m., she gets a call. Every night at 3.43 a.m., she answered. 911, what's your emergency? She'd run through the call from memory in a low murmur that I barely understand. 31 minutes and 27 seconds. That's how long the call always lasts. 31 minutes, 27 seconds. I remember when it first started. She had been so traumatized by the call that the phone calls were accompanied by night terrors. I remember the first week of waking up at 4.15 to her blood curdling screams. It started simple. I would run out of the bedroom and find her in the kitchen thrashing around the floor. I held her down to keep her from giving herself a concussion until her screams turned into ragged sobs. The next night, she was standing by fridge, stomping at nothing. The third night, I found her curled into a ball on the kitchen counter. That was when I encouraged her to seek help. I became more serious about the sixth night. She'd been growing dark bags underneath her eyes from the restless nights by then, but she never remembered the previous night. I tried to be understanding, but what would happen that night was the last straw. Everything happened like clockwork. 3.43, the phone rings. 31 minutes, 27 seconds, hang up. I woke up that night when she walked out of the bedroom door. I signed to myself and got up. I knew what would come next, and I thought I did. I thought I did. Five minutes passed and the screams hadn't started yet. We'd seen a doctor by that point. He advised me not to wake her, but to just try and corral her back in the bed. I had to make an exception that night. I ran out to the kitchen. She was standing on the counter, like she had been the night before. At first, I was relieved. I thought that maybe she was repeating a night's behavior because it was in regression. I was wrong. There was a flash of light, and suddenly she was holding a knife to her own throat. Her eyes were half open, consciousness barely there, focused on me. There was no screaming that night, just a grin. Not her grin. It was like a thin, sickle plastered on her tired face. You won't save her. She said in a voice that was deeper than hers. I charged, jumping on the counter and throwing the knife away. She fell limp in my arms, gently snoring. I checked her into a hospital that day, hoping someone there could help her. When I got home, I noticed her phone sitting on the side table. I considered bringing it to her, but my anger got the better of me. I was pissed and wanted to know who was playing mind games with my wife. I picked up her phone but didn't know the password. I wanted her to rest, so I put it down on a nightstand and steeled myself to answer the call that night. I sat up that night, glancing between the phone and the clock. 3.43. The phone rings. I snatched it up. Who the hell is this? I snarled into the phone. Nothing. Then a quick, quiet click. And a whir. Please, help me. A little girl's voice came through the speaker. She sounded shaky, scared. I opened my mouth to reply, but the voice kept talking. There's a man in my house. There's a pause. I don't, I don't know where he is. Another pause. I'm hiding upstairs in the bathroom. There's a crash, and the girl suppresses a scream. Her breathing grows rapid. He's coming up the stairs. Her frightened statement was accompanied by a loud stomping. I don't have anything. A deep voice creeps into the speaker. Abby. Come out, Abby. The voice growls in an almost playful tune. The girl whimpers at the sound. Please, Harry. She hisses into the phone. Bang, bang, bang. The sound of someone kicking down a door blasted through the speaker. The girl screeched through the phone. Open the door, Abby. The voice growls in an almost maniac euphoria. 
The voice's crazed laughter melds with the girl's screams until... Plop. You won't save her, the voice insists. And then it hung up. There's no sound. I look at the phone screen. 3127. My finger hovers shakily over the end call button, but a voice stops me. You're not the woman from the call center. Their voice sounded like the one from the recording, the one my wife imitated the night before. What? What the hell is this? I tried to keep my voice from shaking. I don't want our pretty lady to forget me. The phone clicks. I look down at the phone to be met with the lock screen. I went to the police that night with the phone and told them everything. They were already familiar with me due to my wife's previous profession and insisted someone would look into it. My wife came home the next day looking more rested than she had in a week. The calls kept coming but my wife's night terror stopped. I never did tell her about my experience at the caller. I thought it would help her. It did. For a while. A week ago, I was watching the news. There was a fluff piece about some kind of festival that celebrated puppies until a breaking news update interrupted it. The update reported that a six-year-old girl's body had been found. Her name? Her name was Abigail Miller, as she had disappeared six years ago. My wife had walked in at that point, dropped the plate she had carried, and wept. I held her that night until she cried herself to sleep on the couch. 3.43 Phone call. 31 minutes, 27 seconds. Silence. I walked out into the living room and she was asleep. I went back to the bed, laid down, and closed my eyes. My phone chimed. I checked my phone. A text from an unknown number. She's cute when she's asleep. See you soon. I haven't gotten much sleep since then. I spent my night sitting in the corner with a knife. I don't know when he's coming, but I'll be ready.